All right. Uh, welcome to our webinar on uh, historic preservation and sustainability. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, as a preface to the webinar, I want to note that this is a topic that has been around since the 1970s. As such, people have covered this topic in depth and uh, you know, folks have written their thesis on it. There are whole books covering the topic. Uh, I will not be going into that level of detail, uh, but I hope to give a broad overview to introduce people to the ideas and to outline how hist historic buildings and neighborhoods play a role in sustainability and to give a sense of what you might uh, do as a member of an historic preservation commission or as an owner of a historic property or just interested in our historic built environment. Uh, if you've been tuning into the ongoing archaeology and historic preservation based webinar series, it is safe to say that you have an interest in preserving the various cultural resources that make up our shared heritage and help shape community identity. I think it would also be safe to say that you not only concern yourself with our common past, but our common future and that you hope we can meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. In discussions on addressing environmental concerns and how to reduce greenhouse gases, talk often focuses on technological advancement. This may be examining the possibilities of electric cars or Tesla's big battery that they are testing in Australia, uh, looking towards future futuristic technology may make it seem like our historic buildings and neighborhoods do not have a role to play. However, the intersection of sustainability and historic preservation is a natural and powerful alliance. <clears throat> so what is sustainability? Uh, sustainability is sort of an umbrella term applied to a range of disciplines. And uh, so that we are all on the same page, we will use the conception of sustainability uh, as the ability for society to leave for the future, the option, or the capacity to be as well off as we are in natural resources, landscapes, and cultural heritage. Uh, this is kind of paraphrasing the economist uh, Robert Solow. This is more than just being environmentally responsible but to recognize that historic buildings and blocks are key components to creating successful cities and neighborhoods, and that retaining historic fabric creates economically vital, uh, socially equitable, and resilient communities. Um, looking at how our historic built environment can help with sustainability is important because in the United States, 43% of carbon emissions and 39% of total energy use is attributed to the construction and operation of buildings. Additionally, one third of our existing building stock, roughly 82 billion square feet, will be demolished and replaced by 2030. The National Trust on Historic Preservation conducted a study that found it takes 10 to 80 years for a new building that is 30% more efficient than the average performing existing building to overcome the negative climate change impacts related to the construction process. Uh, considering the loss of this existing building stock is one of the reasons why this is a topic worth looking at. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, again, misperceptions often exist that historic preservation can be at odds with sustainability and energy efficiency, while in many cases this couldn't be further from the truth. Part of this is because historic buildings and neighborhoods have a number of inherent energy efficient and sustainable features. I'll go through some examples and hope to show how these help support the idea of the quote unquote, uh, the greenest building argument which is that the most sustainable building may be the one that already exists. Uh, an extensive study on this topic has been completed by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and I think we have a uh, link for this. Um, one overarching idea of inherent sustainable features that you may hear is the idea of embodied energy, which considers the energy required to produce a building. This includes the upfront energy investment for extraction of natural resources, manufacturing, transportation, and installation of materials. Along with this, the National Trust for Historic Preservation 
also considers recurring embodied en energy as the energy needed over time to maintain or repair a building over its lifespan and operating energy as the need to operate a building. Uh, we also see here the idea of building transportation energy as uh, the energy utilized to transport occupants to and from buildings, which is another consideration. Uh, this idea of embodied energy has been expanded and quantified through the approach of life cycle assessment, which provides a framework that enables an in-depth look at how key variables such as building lifespan and operating energy efficiency may affect the decision to reuse buildings versus build new. The idea of embodied energy is along the lines of sunk costs paid for by previous generations. A standing building already embodies the expenditure of energy and a historic building has essentially recouped those costs. It makes sense to preserve this embodied energy instead of using more energy to demolish it then send those historic materials to further fill up our landfills, and then using more energy to construct a new building made with energy and CO2 intensive materials like concrete, vinyl, plastics, and other synthetics. Uh, as examples, in 2010, the Environmental Protection Agency found that the average building demolition yields 155 pounds of waste per square foot uh, greatly expanding the footprint of our landfills. Additionally, a study by the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation noted that about 80 billion BTUs of energy are embodied in the typical 50,000 square foot commercial building, uh, the equivalent of about 640,000 gallons of gasoline. If demolished, all this expended energy and carbon has gone to waste. Furthermore, the United Nations Energy Program estimates it takes 20 years of a typical building's 100-year operation just to offset the expenditure of its construction, energy, and materials. And as a side note, looking at all the boxy, cookie-cutter apartment buildings going up in the Denver area and many other urban areas in the state, uh, I have little confidence that they'll make even make it much past 20 years. These ideas of embodied energy, although relatively straightforward, are a little more intangible. However, there are lots of concrete physical examples of how historic buildings are inherently energy efficient and sustainable. Um, <clears throat> historic building construction methods and materials often maximize natural sources of heat, light, and ventilation to respond to local climatic conditions. Early homes had many energy conserving features out of necessity because of the inefficiency of heating and with fireplaces and the lack of artificial cool cooling. Buildings are more than the sum of their individual components, the design, materials, type of construction, size, shape, site orientation, surrounding landscape, and climate all play a role in how buildings perform. Efficient features of historic buildings include operable windows, interior courtyards, clerestories, skylights, rooftop ventilators, cup cupolas, and other features that provide natural ventilation and light that can reduce energy consumption. For example, features such as transoms are often found to be filled in or painted over in historic buildings, but they serve a variety of energy conserving purposes such as lighting and ventilation. Interior halls were often lit by transoms from outside rooms, reducing the need for artificial light. And transoms that can be open provide cross ventilation to a room when the doors, even when the door is closed. Just removing transoms or making them non-functional can severely alter the energy performance of a building. We can look at the difference in walls in some of our, our historic buildings. Thick masonry walls, typical of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, have inherent thermal characteristics that keep the buildings cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. Massive masonry walls have high thermal inertia, which reduces the rate of heat transfer through the wall, offering moderation of temperature extremes in both hot and cold climates and weather. This is why you may notice older public and commercial buildings still, still feel cool during the summer, 
even without air conditioning. Roof construction and design plays a large role in the energy efficiency of historic buildings. Roof overhangs are a particularly effective means of controlling solar heat gain, while steep sloping roofs with minimal or no overhang in colder climates allow for uh, shedding snow and increasing beneficial solar heat gain through the windows. Floor plans, especially of uh, vernacular architecture, also considered how to best respond to uh, the local climates. You may find rooms that need relatively little light or can be cooler than the rest of the house can be placed on the north side. The warmest and brightest rooms, conversely, are on the south side. Or in warm climates, large porches, breezeways, and central halls with tall ceilings help with air circulation. While in colder climates, smaller windows that may have features like interior shutters reduce heat loss and draft. Or you may find that low ceiling rooms are clustered around a central fireplace to maximize use of heat. And even the use of location and landscape help make historic buildings energy efficient. You may consider the orientation of the building where in cold climates, Buildings were oriented against northern winds and may have less openings on that side. And in warmer climates, a building may be located to take advantage of the breeze. Additionally, deciduous trees can help shade or evergreens planted can serve as wind breaks. Uh, so I've outlined, uh, oops, hold on a second. I've outlined some, but not all the inherent energy efficiency features of historic buildings. Uh, the above are probably the most prominent examples. However, specific uh, design, oops, uh, features of historic buildings are not where sustainability ends for our historic resources. Our historic downtowns and neighborhoods are also inherently sustainable and should be considered holistically in planning. In reaction to increasing concerns for sustainable development, there is a growing movement among architects, landscape architects, planners, and even some developers for sustainable development. It goes by many names. Uh, you may hear transportation-oriented development or new urbanism, but the goal is to stop building endless sprawl and to build better cities. Ideals and goals of the movement include areas being mixed use, having tree-lined streets, to consider walkability, include diverse housing, and to have links to adjacent communities and other such ideas. What this movement often fails to realize, despite the belief that some think it is cutting edge, is that historic neighborhoods already meet their list of principles and many more. It is not that their goals are not laudable, but by ignoring historic preservation, they are essentially reinventing the wheel. As has been previously noted, most people understand that preserving historic neighborhoods and commercial districts help maintain a connection to local, state, and national heritage and community identity. But historic preservation also plays a role in sustainable placemaking. There are good reasons for focusing on already developed areas and maintaining density, such as it helps preserve open space and farmland. But preservation of commercial and residential neighborhoods also helps retain the social fabric of a place. Historic neighborhoods and commercial areas are relatively compact, so promote walking. They are more likely to be mixed use and therefore also help cut down on travel. As affordable housing becomes an ever-growing issue and threat to the well-being of our communities, homes constructed before 1950 disproportionately house people of modest means. Additionally, historic commercial areas are incubators of small business. Uh, despite rhetoric and the massive tax breaks they get, large corporations are not the ones creating jobs in the United States. About 85% of net new jobs are created by firms employing less than 20 people. These are also disproportionately found in historic downtowns and neighborhood commercial districts because of the relative affordability of historic buildings. Furthermore, these areas foster distinctive, attractive areas 
with a sense of place. Um, so there's a sort of bridge from what we have been talking about with uh, specific sustainable features in the next sections I will discuss. I wanted to focus on a specific feature of historic buildings that are often that are very important to the character of a building, but are also frequently the first features to be replaced when considering energy efficient energy efficiency. Uh, these are windows. Uh, fenestration overall is important to the historic appearance of a building, and windows are often important character defining features that re represent historic materials, workmanship, and design. However, because of misinformation and misunderstanding, we often lose these important features in trying to make buildings more energy efficient. Uh, you know, they say that eyes are the windows to the soul, and windows are sort of the eyes of a building. And you would look pretty weird too if your eyes were replaced with vinyl. Uh, there's a quote I like about the subject of windows from an article by Walter Setovich and Jill H. Galt Health. It goes uh, Historic windows possess aesthetic and material attributes that simply cannot be replaced by modern replacement windows. Like preserving whole buildings, restoring historic windows is a solid step towards sustainability. Looking at energy efficiency, the vast majority of heat loss in homes is through the attic or uninsulated walls and not windows. Although it is a common misconception that windows are the culprit. Many historic buildings retain wood windows constructed of old growth lum lumber, which can last indefinitely as long as they are properly maintained. Meanwhile, manufacturer warranties for new windows usually max out about 10 years. Uh, for some information on windows as important historic materials, the National Park Service National Center for Preservation Technology and Training has a kind of fun informational comic, uh, which I believe we have a link for that. Windows only account for roughly 10% of energy loss in a building. This is a small amount with only fans slash vents and electrical outlets accounting for less. Properly rehabilitated historic windows have an R factor nearly indistinguishable from new so-called weatherized windows like aluminum or vinyl, particularly when used uh, with the addition of exterior or interior storm windows. Some studies have shown that the payback through energy savings by replacing historic windows can take hundreds of years. Once removed, we have also lost a resource not available anymore. Many historic windows were built with old growth wood that is much more dense, strong, and has incredible longevity. Once thrown in the landfill, this is just gone, and even new wood windows will not act or perform the same as they are made with new growth lumber. Wood also has an advantage in that it expands and contracts with the temperature. That responsiveness means that it is both strong enough and responsive enough to accommodate inflexible glass. If properly maintained or repaired, there really is no reason to replace historic wood windows. Some municipalities have cost calculators that help homeowners assess the cost of rehabilitation compared to replacement. Uh, the city of Fort Collins has a really good one uh, that's in an Excel sheet and under the re Windows tab, Rehab and Replacement of Historic Windows always beats out the replacement. Uh, also, just to note, going, going on Windows, this isn't meant to shame anybody if they have replaced their historic wood windows. I'm sure you made the decisions that uh, was appropriate for your house and your, your family and perhaps you didn't have all the information you wanted or needed. Uh, but now that you know, if you have family or friends talking about replacing their historic wood windows, you know, just politely take them aside and let them know uh, what they're doing. Uh, but all this isn't to say that energy efficiency of historic buildings and particular features can't be improved or that there are not any areas where they fall short. As we move beyond the 1920s, both residential and commercial buildings became relatively less 
energy efficient than their forebears, particularly post World War II. This coincides with the increasing adoption of air conditioning and forced air heat, as well as the influence that new materials and construction techniques had on both residential and commercial, commercial and office buildings. Especially post World War II, we see abundant and cheap energy that no one thought was going anywhere, and this affected how people thought about building construction. It was a time of technological utopianism. Uh, the graphic here is for uh, commercial building energy use by vintage, and we can see a dramatic increase in all energy uses uh, as we move along, along through time. So, Houses and buildings built prior to 1920 tend to have more energy conserving features built into their building envelope, but do not have sophisticated mechanical systems unless they have been modernized. While post-World War II buildings have more sophisticated mechanical systems that have fewer energy conserving features of the types shown in previous slides in their building envelope. Uh, the ability to use technology to overcome nature meant that inherent energy and heating and cooling features of old, older buildings were no longer necessary to design around. It was thought that technology would solve everything, including nuclear technology. Uh, this was a time when some of the first nuclear power plants came online and people thought electrical power would become quote unquote too cheap to meter. And uh, not a historic preservation thing, but just for uh, just for fun on the promises of nuclear power. Uh, here we have the 1957 Ford Nucleon, a proposed nuclear power car. I uh, don't think you'd want to be uh, rear-ended in that thing and cause a meltdown. We can see the growing influence of technology in commercial buildings when in the 1930s, fluorescent lamps and double-paned windows were introduced. Then by the 1950s and beyond, the aluminum curtain wall was more extensively used, a construction technique that moved beyond operable windows and thermal mass of, uh, of earlier construction. The net effect is that all buildings began to use a lot more energy. This was an approach that was really only reconsidered with the energy crisis of the 1970s and the beginning of the modern environmentalist movement. This makes it tricky when considering that buildings constructed in 1970 now meet the 50-year-old guidance of the National Register of Historic Places. And many mid-century neighborhoods and buildings are important historical resources to many cities and towns. Additionally, the neighborhoods that arose following World War II were also less sustainable. Investment in and construction of highways and interstates, subsidies by the Federal Housing Authority, along with growing reliance on the automobile, made it feasible for developers to invest in constructing subdivisions well out of historic urban and suburban areas. This created a greater reliance on travel and increase in energy consumption. However, it is not that earlier buildings did not have their own shortcomings. Probably one of the most glaring issues is the lack of insulation, particularly in attic spaces. This combined with uh, maintenance issues can lead to problems with heat loss. Cold air that infiltrates through holes, cracks, loose windows, and doors will cause the heating system to work harder. Issues are magnified in multi-story buildings where cold air that enters at lower levels forces air up, which will push air through leaky areas and even through uninsulated attics right out of the building. This is called the stack effect. And it not only leads to heat loss, but may also lead to damaging moisture entering wall cavities and attic spaces. Fortunately, for many issues, there are relatively easy ways to address such energy issues. Um, so now I want to give you an overview of what you can do as an owner of a historic residence or commercial building, as well as how you may be able to guide best practices in your own community as a historic preservation commission. Throughout all consideration of rehabilitation and adaptive re reuse with energy efficiency and sustainability in mind, you must consider the significance of the building, how that significance is represented physically and retaining the historic integrity of the resource 
to ensure that the building can continue, continue to authentically represent why it is important. There are tools to help you in identifying these aspects, including National Park Service Brief Number 17, uh, which is titled Architectural Character, Identifying the Visual Aspects of Historic Buildings as an Aid to Preserving Their Character. Uh, the key to a successful, re oh, and we have a, a, I believe we have a link for that as well. Um, the key to a successful rehabilitation project for energy efficiency is to identify and understand any lost original and existing energy efficient aspects of the historic building, as well as to identify and understand its character defining features to ensure they are preserved. Retaining authentic features is key to rehabilitation and no one should take lightly the option of discarding historic materials. In considering how this authenticity is demonstrated, the National Register of Historic Places evaluates seven aspects of integrity. This being location, setting, design, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. I won't go into detail here because uh, these have been covered in previous webinars, so please take a look at those as well. Further consideration must include seeking to follow the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. There are 10 standards and they are common sense principles that allow for flexibility in use, preservation of historic character, maintaining as much historic material as possible, repairing rather than re replacing, uh, making compatible alterations, and they apply to the interior as well as the exterior of historic buildings. These have been covered in pre also been covered in previous webinars. Uh, the National Park Service has even published an SOI standards for rehabilitation specifically with sustainability in mind in order to help you, and we'll have a, a link for that as well. So first I will touch on how to approach individual buildings, what steps can be taken, and issues that can be addressed. A worthwhile early step is to understand what constitutes a historically significant building and understand when a building is deemed significant, and what benefits, protections, and regulations apply to it. Your town or city may have design review regulations that may dictate process and guide appropriate best practices. Even without pertinent local ordinance, it should be considered what are the appropriate treatment practices for historic buildings. This always ties back to the Secretary of Interior standards mentioned above. Additionally, the National Park Service has a collection of preservation briefs that provide information about best practices, uh, including preservation brief number three, specifically discussing improving energy efficiency. And I think we should have a link for that as well. Another early step that should be done is undertake an energy audit to identify deficiencies in the building envelope or mechanical systems. It is best to seek an independent auditor who does not have a financial interest in the outcome, such as a product vendor, say someone who's selling windows. Yeah, leave, your, leave your historic windows alone. If uh, cost is an issue, some local utility companies or even municipalities may offer a free baseline audit. It is important to note that they may not have the knowledge of the inherent energy, efficient, energy efficiency features of your specific historic building and may make recommendations based off assumptions we discussed earlier. Some recommended upgrades may not be done to a historic building feasibly without damaging historic fabric or character defining features. When seeking energy upgrades, try to balance what will provide the most payback, but compromise the historic character the least. Actions that require minimal alteration include reducing air leakage, adding attic insulation, installing storm windows, insulating basements and crawl spaces, sealing and insulating ducts and, and pipes, weather stripping doors and add storm doors, and adding awnings and shading devices where appropriate. Of these, reducing heat transfer to the roof or attic should be one of the highest priorities that will give you the best value. Again, for windows, it has been shown that traditional wood windows with the addition of a storm window can equal that 
of a double glazed replacement window. For more complicated steps that require higher level of alterations, preservation brief number three lists adding interior vestibules, replacing windows, adding insulation to wood frame walls, adding insulation to masonry walls, and installing cool roofs and green roofs. It must be noted that the treatments in the second group often pose the risk of damaging historic building materials and architectural features and need to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Another consideration may include installation of alternative energy sources, such as so solar panels. Installation of solar panels have become more and more popular. This is another instance to tread carefully. Composed of very different materials and massing, installation of solar panels can significantly alter the historic appearance of, of a building. The Secretary, uh, Secretary of Interior Standards recommend installing a low profile solar device on a historic building so that it is not visible or only minimally visible from the public right of way, such as on a flat roof and then to have them parallel to the roof. It should also be kept in mind installing a solar device on the historic building in a manner that does not damage historic roofing material or negatively impact the building's historic character and is reversible. Uh, these are more of the individual steps uh, for individual buildings, but municipalities and historic preservation commissions and certified local governments can play an important role in promoting the balance of historic preservation and sustainability. More and more HPCs, uh, historic preservation commissions, are having to grapple with discussions of sustainability and may feel put in a hard spot when their municipality adopts ordinances pertaining to sustainability. In addressing this, the National Trust for Historic Preservation previously released uh, developing sustainability guidelines for historic districts, and they also have a preservation and sustainability page on their website. I recommend checking these out and we will, we will have that link. Uh, I wanted to touch on some of the topics that this document and their guidance covers. Uh, they cover issues such as making smart use of land, having guidelines that promote appropriate infill in historic districts to maintain density, guidance on appropriate construction of additional units on a lot to accommodate affordable housing, uh, and promoting adaptive reuse and rehabilitation to keep waste out of landfills and help limit their footprint. Uh, they also lay out an energy efficiency strategy, uh, discuss how design guidelines can help illustrate and maintain the inherent energy efficient features of historic buildings and promoting energy efficient features such as uh, appropriate on such as appropriate awnings on historic commercial buildings. It also shows how historic preservation commissions can take on the difficult discussion of alternative energy like solar panels. It is these are good tools and uh, what is most appropriate for your own community will depend on the context and resources of that individual community. But this and other resources show how historic preservation commissions can be both powerful drivers of historic preservation and sustainability. Um, now I wanted to take some time to highlight fun stuff like some cool rehabilitation projects. Some demonstrate rehab for specific energy efficiency purposes and others are more just the broader idea of adaptive reuse. Uh, so first we have engine house number five uh, located in Denver. It was constructed in 1922 as an engine house for the city and county of Denver Fire Department. The building has impressively remained in continuous use since including as an engine house up until 1979. Engine house number five is listed as a contributing building in the lower downtown historic district. Recently used as the fire line shop for the city, Slatterpaul Architects purchased the building to adaptively reuse it as an architectural offices and as part of a larger project to achieve a platinum lead rating for the building. Um, the project addressed critical deficiencies in exterior masonry and terracotta on the building, including reconstruction of an original eyebrow roof on 
uh, at the east end of the south elevation. This was combined with uh, innovative improvements such as chilled beam technology that uses radiator-like equipment to actually cool surfaces within the building, which is pretty, uh, pretty snazzy. And uh, this and photovolactic, um, oops, sorry, I lost my spire. Photovolactic solar panels and recycled building materials were some of the strategies that allowed this building to be certified as the first lead platinum historic building in the state. This successful project had assistance from the State Historical Fund, preservation tax credits, and grant money from the Colorado Office of Energy. Uh, most recently, Interior Environments purchased the former fire station. And uh, I won't go through all the partnerships in these uh, case studies, but just to note, they often look like a, a arrangements such as this. You know, typically, say historical fund is involved, often tax credits, and then a variety of uh, local or state stakeholders uh, to make these uh, cool rehab projects happen. Here we have the Fruitdale School uh, located in Wheat Ridge. The Fruitdale Grade School in Wheat Ridge is significant for education due to its association with the Fruitdale and later Wheat Ridge area as the only school serving the community from 1927 until its closure in 1978. The school is also significant under social history as the primary gathering space for the Fruitdale community. Furthermore, Fruitdale Grade School is locally significant as a good example of an Art Deco style school building and is a design by well-known Denver architect, Temple Buell. The 1.4 acre site was purchased by the Wheat Ridge Housing Authority in 2011 after Jefferson County Public Schools decommissioned the school and scheduled demolition. The building had, had been vacant since 2007 and was in extreme disrepair. Uh, the building was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2013 as the first steps to rehabilitating the property. Uh, the city entered into a public-private partnership to adaptively reuse the school as affordable housing. The project is also unique in that uh, housing is eco-friendly in that it it's utilizing solar power for centralized heating and cooling. Here we have the Yampa Valley Electric Association building located in Steamboat. Uh, the Yampa Valley Electric Association facility in the uh, Steamboat Springs compromised, uh, comprised an office building, a large maintenance and truck gar garage structure, and an elevated parking garage. The original building was uh, designed by Eugene Sternberg and was completed in 1956. And there is a 1964 edition. And it has since been rehabilitated for the adaptive reuse of uh, Mountain Tap Brewery. Uh, I didn't have more, a lot more background on this, but you know, I just uh, thought it illustrated how uh, the idea of appropriate uses can be really broad in rehabilitation, uh, from going from essentially an office building to a brewery. Uh, next, we have the Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks Lodge in Montrose. The Montrose Elks Lodge was constructed in 1927 by locally known architect J. H. Antrobus. The building exhibits the eclectic elements typical of his design and can also be seen on the nearby City Hall building. The building served as the meeting place for the Elks for over 40 years and the building was a center for community activities, hosting dinners, graduation ceremonies, and fundraising events. The building served as an Elks Lodge until 1969 when the group moved to a new building that was constructed downtown. The lodge was then used by Colorado Western College until its closure in 1972. Montrose County Social Services used the building from 1976 to 2003, and the building was bought in 2003 by the city of Montrose. The property has been rehabilitated for use as a municipal services center and meeting venue, and rehabilitation included the installation of a renewable energy geo-exchange system for heating and cooling. Um, so then next we have Buffalo Peaks Ranch located in Park County. Uh, Buffalo Peaks Ranch is one of the oldest ranches in the South Park Basin. 
with its roots in Adolf and Marie Giraud's 1862 homestead along the Middle Fork of uh, the South Platte River between Hartzell and Fair Play. In 1985, the city of Aurora acquired the ranch for its water rights and fishing access. And in 2013, Aurora leased the ranch's historic buildings and some land to the Rocky Mountain Land Library. The Rocky Mountain Land Library's mission is to help connect people to nature and the land and serves as a residential library. The library's collection is centered around nature and includes about 30,000 books about animals, water, geology, sustainability, ecology, and more. In addition, they host a range of workshops and events throughout the year, and it's uh, located in a really uh, gorgeous spot. Uh, there's also the Ivy Wild School in Colorado Springs, which was built in 1916 as an elementary school located just south of downtown Colorado Springs. The school ceased operations in 2009, and in March 2012, the building was purchased with the goal of strengthening neighborhood identity or restoring a historic centerpiece of the area. The property was rehabilitated and opened in 2013 as a community marketplace and local gathering spot, including such features as Bristol Brewing. Another example is the Stanley Marketplace located in Aurora. This building was part of a sprawling factory started by U.S. Navy test pilot Robert Stanley in 1954 to design, test, and manufacture ejection seats for the military. Stanley continued to manufacture high-tech aerospace parts at the plant until 2007 when the factory closed for good. Rehabilitation of the building started in 2015, employing a low-impact design and reuse materials wherever possible. And the building now serves as a community marketplace with a wide, wide range of businesses located within. Uh, so again, just some fun examples that show how we can uh, reuse these properties that tell, you know, the story of communities, as well as, uh, uh, you know, continue and push new sustainable ideas. Um, so in wrapping up, there is a quote I like to use from Diane Lee about historic preservation. Uh, she states, preservation in America is about nurturing the grass roots and assisting communities with the preservation of physical structures objects, and settings that tell the story of our collective past. But preservation is also great in how it intersects with other grassroots movements, such as, such as social and environmental justice, and environmentalism and sustainability. I think because of this intersection, preservation can cast a wide net of those who get involved. And I think it is a great way to pull people in who are maybe at first skeptical, such, such as say you, you are on a historic preservation commission and you have a city council member who is unsure of the benefits of historic preservation, but you know they are a staunch supporter of sustainability. I hope that after this and review of some of the linked materials, that now you can reach common ground and win folks over, uh, win folks over the preser with to preservation and strive towards common goals. Uh, thanks for your time. We'll have some uh, time for questions, and uh, I want to thank. Uh, uh, Erica for running stuff and the opportunity to present this. Thanks so much. Uh, and just as a reminder, folks, if you would like to submit a question, you can just click on the Q&A button there at the bottom of, of your screen and type it in and we would be happy to answer it for you. And again, just seeing questions come on, you know, the, again, this is a really, uh, the idea of sustainability and sort of preservation is a really broad topic and people have kind of dived in depth on various, uh, you know, specifics of, of the field and how it intersects with sustainability. So it can, there's lots of things out there if you want to kind of dig and look at, a, a, you know, like the, citations and bibliography of some of the sources we 
uh, noted, you know, they'll uh, lead you to a whole other realm of materials from which you can uh, look at. Okay, looks like we got some questions coming in. Um, first, I've, I noticed that the solar panels for the Fruitdale School building were not located within the footprint of the building itself. Do solar panels qualify for a sort of preservation tax credits if located outside of the building footprint? And um, I'm not the tax credit expert, but I do not believe that those uh, qualified for the, those credits, I think they uh, qualified for other credits such as uh, uh, you know there's kind of energy efficiency credits that come from the state and things like that and uh, so as part of that project they utilized a lot of different tools uh, including as I mentioned a grant from the uh, um, Colorado Energy Office but uh, typically things that uh, qualify for tax credits fit within those Secretary of Interior standards but uh, Again, sorry, sorry for, I don't want to say yes or no because I'm not the, the expert. Perhaps perhaps Erica knows who also uh, isn't knows uh, a lot of the sustainability kind of stuff. Uh, is there any crazy, oh, was, were you going to chime in, Erica? Oh, no, I was going to say I agree. I don't think it would count for the rehabilitation tax credits. But like you said, there's lots of uh, energy tax credits out there and grants as well. So. Um. Thank you. Uh, is there a crazy example of preservation work done in the name of sustainability? Um, I don't know any off the top of my head, but I would say that there most likely probably is, uh, you know, some things that, uh, some really kind of out there uh, rehabilitations or stuff. Uh, I don't know any off the top of my head, but uh, in the world of preservation, there's always a crazy example of something. So I would assume it's uh, out there. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of examples of historic buildings that have been completely gutted uh, on the interior and often have had their windows replaced and, and some exterior features replaced, even in kind, um, in the name of sustainability, in the name of, you know, well, there's no way we can possibly uh, rehabilitate this building and keep any of the interior and also make it sustainable. Um, I don't think you'd have to look too hard to find an example like that, but of course we probably wouldn't want to call them out during this either. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> uh, what resources are there for considering replacing modern renovated windows with more historically appropriate windows? Um, again, I would really point you to those uh, Secretary of Interior standards uh, for rehabilitation, uh, that sustainability one, and as well as the technical preservation briefs that the Park Services ha has. Uh, there's various things you want to consider to be historically appropriate. You know, you'd, you'd want to look at things like, uh, is there historic documentation of what was there before or, uh, you know, there's some, if you don't have that, there's some wiggle room and is it, uh, you know, more appropriate, but you're not trying to, uh, rep you know, you're not saying that this is historic, you know, you can kind of differentiate from uh, uh, what it was to make it may look a little better. And, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it can be kind of tricky when, we're go when you're kind of going Backwards, but again, if you have good fo historic photos and s things like that, and then, um, you know, look towards your, if you have a local historic 
uh, preservation office at your city, you know, they're always a good resource and may know other resources for who can do kind of such, such work uh, for that. Um, so there, there's a lot of, so surprisingly, there's quite a few people who work with these kind of windows and, you know, even if it's wood and you're not replacing the whole thing, you, you really do need to repair. There's different techniques to retain as much of the uh, historic materials you can, kind of doing Dutchman cuts of new wood to the old wood, and uh, there's a lot you can do uh, with windows. And we are seeing a lot more manufacturers out there, um, unfortunately, you know, replacing historic windows with ones uh, that look more period appropriate. So we see a lot of aluminum windows that are wood clad. Um, so that might be something to consider if you've already lost the historic windows. Um, you also want to keep in mind, you know, if you have those vinyl replacement windows already, I, as much as we would like a building to return to looking as it did historically, um, we wouldn't want to do that at the, you know, you wouldn't want to waste the <laughs> windows you have. If they're still good, um, might as well keep them until they reach the end of their life and then consider a more appropriate replacement. But like Jason said, you know, wood windows now are going to be all new growth wood, so you're not going to get the same longevity as you would with the historic ones. So you might be wanting to look at the alternative materials then, that you could still get the same look, um, but hopefully get some more longevity out of them. Um, so the next question we have is, how would you approach historic buildings or structures with modifications that are significant in their own right, but may cause problems with sustainability? Um, yeah, I think the key word there is, you know, the modifications have gained significant in their own right. And as I uh, kind of mentioned during the presentation, uh, you know, you want to really consider any time removing historic materials, which those would be. So it may cause problems with sustainability, uh, depending on the issue. Again, there may be uh, very easy uh, approaches to address that uh, lack of energy efficiency caused by, you know, caused by modifications. But it's, uh, you know, again, it's kind of, balancing uh, what makes the building important, its character defining features, and getting the best uh, energy efficiency and sustainability out of your building. So um, without a specific example, I guess it's kind of hard to say, but again, I'll just kind of note that uh, your word of a significant in their own right is important to consider throughout any consideration of uh, trying to address uh, sustainability and energy efficiency. Oops. Uh, so one's just kind of more of a, a, a note. Uh, thank you for uh, pointing this out. It says somebody had, there are federal tax credits for solar installation separate from historic preservation. But those tax credits are scheduled to sunset. This year they're 26% and next year they'll be 21%. So just a FYI for folks on that. Also, okay, the other question we have also regarding windows in a historic building, how inappropriate is it that aluminum frame windows have been replaced with vinyl? Um, again, that may really depend. It's ob obviously there are historic buildings that the aluminum windows may be uh, original. And in that case, uh, you know, we may not think of them as historic, but then those are also historic materials. Uh, which you, you'd want to consider. But, uh, you know, it, it, it depends on case-by-case -case basis when, you know, uh, have been replaced with vinyl. So that's kind of like, you know, if those aluminum windows weren't uh, historic materials themselves, then, you know, perhaps the vinyl is not the, the biggest issue. Um, so uh, so that, that case, it, it's... Uh, not, sorry, not for the clear answer, but it's, uh, you know, another kind of case by case. It depends on uh, the building itself, what, what it's significant for, what its features are, and if that, uh, if those are replacement materials themselves that are being replaced and different things li like that. Um, yeah, sorry, that was probably the, the clearest answer, but uh, another question 
It seems that there may be specific benefits to communities of color in terms of historic preservation and sustainability, especially since communities of color are disproportionately affected by environmental racism. How can we seek to democratize the benefits of sustainable sort buildings and neighborhoods? And I would just say that is a really uh, great question and uh, probably hard to answer fully in, in this venue. Obviously with recent events, this is something that uh, is uh, again come to the forefront of historic preservation. I think it's something that's a discussion that's always been there and ongoing. And, um, you know, how we can seek to democratize the benefits of stable historic buildings and neighborhoods is, you know, perhaps making sure the local communities have access to and are aware of the various tools that may uh, help them with that. Again, maybe uh, preservation tax credits or local or, uh, you know, preservation grants or uh, certified local government grants. And, uh, you know, I think there's a issue of uh, outreach and uh, education just to make sure people who need these uh, can have access to to the tools. And uh, it, it, it's a really good question because even though it's a, something we're all aware of, I don't think that it uh, has been, it, you know, evenly democratized and uh, utilized, been able, open to those who could probably most use these, these benefits, but uh, that's a really Good question, and I, I don't think I have the ability to really uh, answer it, except for it's something we we should all be s striving towards. Well, now I'll just chime in on that one too, Jason. Obviously, I don't have all the answers to that, um, but I think one thing that we have been discussing just in our office and with some of our communities here in Colorado is is lowering the barriers for entry into things like getting a tax credit for your home, because obviously. To receive a tax credit that implies that you have a certain amount of income um, that you would need to be receiving in order to take the benefit of that credit um, and that's not the case for everyone so um, finding ways that we can provide these benefits other than you know our traditional means like tax credits um, and also just providing that community education to people about how to care for their own buildings how to um, avoid getting into a situation where you have deferred maintenance and where, you know, repairing your home is just going to cost such an incredible amount of money that no one could afford it. Um, so maybe that's something as simple as having a workshop in your community about how to repair wood windows and maybe someone's home in the community gets repaired at that same time as part of that workshop. Um, I've seen that done in uh, some other states, not here in Colorado. Uh, but that's just one one way I've seen that people are are trying to democratize the benefits of preservation. So I think there's lots of ideas that we would, and if anyone else has any, we'd be happy to hear them. Yeah, and and, and that goes to I'll, I'll use that to pitch Erica's upcoming webinar on maintaining your historic home and kind of showing how that's it can be achievable to local homeowners, and it can also uh, you know, again, the the looking towards workshops, I think, again, kind of working with local stakeholders or people you can bring in. I've had the opportunity to attend a couple workshops from uh, the Association for Preservation Technology, and, uh, you know, they get into some really nitty-gritty uh, uh, repair techniques for, you know, from log cabins to wood windows to various things. So, uh, again, it's I think it's a big thing of there's resources out there and it's kind of uh, uh, finding those partnerships and knowing what, what's out there. And as preservationists, you know, one of our roles is trying to make sure people have access to those things.